Have you ever been around someone and just thought, wow, I bet he has bodies in the basement back home, or the person just gives off those bad vibes that make you take note, usually in the form of a mental note to self. Avoid that dude. Well, I have. In fact, he was my dentist. You see, I'm a creature of strict habit. I do the exact same things at the exact same times every single day. Routine. I like sameness. I like routine. And I've had the same job for 18 years. And that's why, even though the man unnerved me, I did not search for a new dentist all those years ago. No. I remained an ever-faithful patient of Dr. William Lucas, DDS. And that's why I remained a prep cook at Steve's Bar and Grill in Jonesboro, Tennessee for 18 years. Co-workers come and go, but the job remains the same. A while back, Steve, the owner of Steve's Bar and Grill, came in early and sat down at the bar. He started drinking peppermint schnapps even though it was only 10 in the morning. And I knew it was going to be one of those days, so I avoided him. He was belligerent when he was drinking. I never liked Steve much to start with, but when he was drinking, oh man. Anyway, he had hired a new waitress. Her name was Allison, but everybody called her Allie. And nearing the end of her senior year of college, Allison, the waitress, thought she was the shit. She looked down her nose at everybody, especially her co-workers. Now, our line cook liked her, and Steve liked her a lot. And to be honest, I think he just liked looking at her. No matter how much she screwed up, he kept her on at the restaurant. And for several weeks, I absolutely hated her. She was chaos personified. She ruined routines. And she was just undisciplined. In short, she was my exact opposite. She had a smart mouth bad attitude and was flaky and silly as her bottled platinum hair implied. And every order she wrote down was wrong in some way, and she was constantly yelling changes through the expo window to the cooks. She smiled a lot, but they were fake smiles, and I understood that. She worked up close and personal with the customers, customers like a smiling face. But with a slight twist of her head, tightening at the corners of that smile and a fraction of difference in the lift of her eyebrows and she was calling you an idiot with just her look. For some reason though, I started to like her. I don't know, maybe it was her smart ass attitude, maybe it reminded me of myself. Maybe, like Steve, well maybe I just like looking at her. We began to talk and got to know each other better and I hated her less and less each day, until one day, we were friends. Our morning line cook, Eddie Von Hyatt, better known as Mr. Ed amongst the kitchen staff, had his eye on Allie too. He considered himself a goddamned warlock. A no bullshit, died in the wool, authentic warlock. My opinion? Well, he was just on some serious kick-ass drugs. But because Allie was around me more at work, so was the annoying Mr. Ed. I swear, I believe if I had shoved his head underwater and held him there, the man would have sprouted gills and continued talking through them. He never shut up. He slithered his way into our conversations at every opportunity. He inserted himself into our plans, like, I don't know. One day, Allie and I were planning on going to see live music in the downtown park. That evening, Mr. Ed showed up and stood with us the entire time, finding ways and reasons to slide up close to Allie, even if it meant slipping between me and her. She and I kept the relationship secret for our own personal reasons and adjusted our schedules at work so that we had more time with each other before the place opened for business. Those were some good times. Some hot times, too. We grew closer and closer until all I could think about was stealing some time with Allie. One morning, she showed up at our regular time, and just as things were heating up in the back of the kitchen, 
we heard the back door's air screen kick on, then off as the door clanked shut. It was Mr. Ed. That man had never been early for anything in his life, but he began showing up early every day that we did. And as you can imagine, this put quite a damper on Allie and my secret relationship. Nothing like an airhead chatterbox warlock to ruin the mood, if you know what I mean. This went on for a while. Allie assured me that he would get the hint soon enough and go back to his normal schedule, leaving us alone in the mornings again. Well, weeks passed. Mr. Red was still there and more annoying than ever. And I noticed a change in Allie during that time. Not a good change. She seemed to be avoiding me some of the time. She even started standing on the line and chatting and giggling with Mr. Ed. I was not pleased, but we weren't married. Hell, we weren't even officially dating. She came to me one day in the back of the kitchen and said she had heard about a weird thing for us to do together. I agreed before I even knew what this weird thing was. In my mind, it would seem to be something, I don't know, kinky. Hell, I was literally up for anything at that point. Then she told me that she wanted Mr. Ed to come along, and I nearly fell over. She said she had come to feel sorry for him, that he was lonely and that he was looking for acceptance. She wanted to include him in our weird thing. Now, I looked right at her. I told her I was not climbing into bed with Mr. Ed for love or money. I didn't care how lonely he was. And I was absolutely furious. And she laughed and told me that the weird thing she wanted to do was a dental date. Now, I'll be damned. I'd never heard of such a thing. It's supposed to be one of those fun dates. I mean, silly in my opinion that friends go out and do those things, but whatever. It lets you get something necessary done while you're in the company of friends. And she admitted that she was afraid of the dentist and usually put off going because of it. It was my turn to laugh. Miss Hard-Nosed Smart Mouth was afraid of dentists. She said Mr. Ed had bad teeth and she thought it would be nice if he joined us so that he could get them fixed. I told her that he was a grown man and could take himself to the dentist. But she kept on with the idea, wearing me down. I hadn't been with her in weeks. And so, I showed up for work one morning, and Mr. Ed's car was parked in front of Allie's. The hoods were cool under my hand, meaning that they had been there for a good while. I went in, my heart pounding with jealousy, and I walked straight to my workspace. Mr. Ed was making a big show of getting something out of the walk-in freezer, and Allie stood at my prep table, guilty look on her face, just folding a stack of aprons. Mr. Ed got his things from the freezer and babbled as he went back to the front line. Now Allie turned to me, holding the stack of neatly folded aprons. I couldn't help but notice the smudges on both knees of her jeans, or that her hands shook slightly as she tried to smile at me. As she neared me, I leaned in for a quick kiss, and she turned her head, giggling. She swatted playfully at me and went to put up the aprons. She avoided me nearly the whole day after that, and I had plenty of times to think about what I'd almost witnessed between her and Mr. Ed. Poor, lonely Mr. Ed with his bad teeth. Well, I'd show him bad teeth. At the end of the day, I caught up with Allie in the parking lot and told her I would go with her on the dental date. And if she wanted to take Mr. Ed along, hey, whatever, that was fine. The more the merrier, right? That seemed to make her happy. It made her happier when I told her that I knew the perfect dentist. Mine. She didn't have a dentist, and obviously neither did Mr. Ed. Now, I talked to Dr. Lucas, and after explaining my story to him, and after he had a really good laugh, he told me that he would clear his schedule one afternoon just for us, and I thanked him and hung up the phone. The Friday for the appointment came, and all three of us went together in my car. It was the biggest and had the most room. 
Dr. Lucas greeted us and locked the office after we had entered. He flipped the closed sign around and motioned for us to follow him. Allie asked why he'd locked the door and turned the sign, and he assured her that it was only so no one would think the office was open. He had closed it early so that we would enjoy our dental date without a bunch of strangers rambling around, demanding treatment. And then he laughed and walked into his office where he made a show of getting all our pertinent information. His eyes darted restlessly from Allie and Mr. Ed to me. Daniel, I know you only need a cleaning, um, so do you mind to sit in the chair first? I told him that would be fine with me. It might even ease Allie's mind. She's afraid of dentists, you know. I winked at Allie and patted her shoulder as I walked behind the chair and out of the room. Dr. Lucas had three private rooms with patient chairs in them. I chose the first door I came to and plopped into the chair. There was a larger room that held three more chairs, with only those movable cubicle walls to separate them a bit. Minutes later, he led Allie and Mr. Ed to that room, and then returned to mine and closed the door. A chill swept over me as he started cleaning my teeth. It was something about the look in his eyes that did it. He was acting a lot stranger than ever. When he finished, he told me to go let my friends see that I was fine, reassure them, and then go to the waiting room until he was finished with them. He came to the waiting room and told me that both Mr. Ed and Allie were going to require lots of work. It would take him a couple of hours to complete it, but I could leave and come back for them later if I wanted. I'm thinking about the smudges on the knees of her pants that day at work. I agreed. I'd go have an early dinner and come back, and Dr. Lucas grinned wide and let me out, locking the door behind me. So I drove uptown and stopped at a little burger joint that played 1960s rock and roll through their overhead speakers. The music was too loud, and the food too greasy, the building too brightly colored for me on most days. But I felt pretty good that day. I felt lighter and happier than I had the past few weeks. I felt like celebrating a little bit. I talked to the waitress, even gave her my number. Before I left, I asked for a takeout box for my fries. It had the little bright blue logo on the lid. I smiled thanked her, gave her too much of a tip, and headed back to Dr. Lucas's office. The door was still locked, so I knocked. No answer. I called the office phone from my cell. Again, no answer. I texted Allie, and when she didn't answer, I called her phone. Still no answer. I didn't have any contact info for Mr. Ed, and the back door was locked. There was a side door, but it was only accessible by climbing over a brick wall that hit the walkway and surrounded the little grassy area. There was a picnic table for use by Lucas's staff. Now I knew that door led into the large room where he had taken Allie and Mr. Ed, so I scaled the six-foot wall. As I topped over, my phone fell from its case and shattered on the concrete below. Cursing, I picked it up and slid it into my pocket. I knocked at that door, but no answer. I tried it, but it was locked, so I knocked harder. And I eventually just yelled, Hey, let me in! And banged the door with my foot and my fist to make sure it was loud enough to be heard inside. I peeped through the little window in the door. And to my horror, I saw Mr. Ed. He was covered in blood. His eyes were missing. His jaw hung slack as if broken, and he had no teeth. He was strapped to the chair with the zip ties at the ankles and wrists. And I saw Dr. Lucas, who was still working on Allie. He drove a plaque pick into her eye, yanked it out, and thick fluid spilled down her cheek. He did the same with her other eye. I gagged. In my head, I was screaming at him to stop, but... In reality, my body wasn't moving. I was frozen in place, paralyzed by what I was witnessing. He started pulling out her teeth, slowly, and admiring each one before placing them into a stainless bowl. 
I tried to move, but my body was like lead. Tears slipped down my cheeks. Dr. Lucas picked up a drill, turned it on, and held it above Allie's forehead. The bit seemed longer than any I'd ever seen in a dentist's office before. It must have been four inches. Long, thin, deadly. It descended toward her forehead. Her perfect, unblemished forehead. And until then, I had thought she was dead. But when the drill tip sank into her skin, she screamed and started thrashing in the chair. She was bound with zip ties and couldn't get loose. Blood jetted up, spraying Dr. Lucas, and he flinched backwards. Half the drill bit sank into her head and still she screamed. Still, she bucked and writhed. It broke my paralysis and I started banging on the door, jerking the handle, screaming. Dr. Lucas continued his work. He pushed the drill all the way into her head, and all the movement ceased suddenly, as if someone had hit the off switch. And then, well, I don't remember anything else. I must have passed out because I came back to awareness in a hospital room where a police officer sat in a chair waiting for me to wake. He made a call as soon as we made eye contact, and soon two detectives were in my room, shoving horrid, gory pictures under my nose and demanding answers. One picture showed Allie's face close up, her eyeless sockets accusing me. There were several small holes lined up around her forehead. Drill holes. My stomach nodded. Another showed Mr. Ed's tongue had been slit down the middle. The cops said that it had been done prior to his death, while he was still awake. And that was when I got sick. The cops and detectives, well, they were pissed. None of them believed me when I told them what had happened and they tried to prove that I had something to do with the gruesome deaths, but <laughs> nothing stuck, because I didn't have anything to do with it, I wasn't even in the room. And they never found Dr. Lucas, and they never found Allie's missing teeth, nor Ed's. They searched my car, my house, Steve's bar and grill, and everywhere else they could get a warrant for. They found nothing, of course. I don't know where the psycho doctor had gone. Eventually, I got better and returned to work. I mean, nobody talks to me anymore, not even Steve. No one comes to the back of the kitchen for anything while I'm there. I've told anyone who asks me that I had nothing to do with the deaths of Allie and Ed. And I didn't, I swear. Today, a package arrived in the mail for me. It was no return address. I opened it, and the beaded bracelet fell out. There was no note, nothing to identify the sender. Curious, I took it to the window, using the sunlight to inspect the slightly imperfect roundness of each bead. The beads were various sizes, and they were all pearly white.